This is not Uncharted. This just might in some ways be better. One objective statement and one that is certainly up for debate. But regardless, Tomb Raider as it exists today sits at a strange place within the medium. It's a rebooted series of games that keeps doing extremely poorly in the eyes of its publisher and in the case of Rise in the eyes of nearly everyone, at least in terms of sales, but it also may be one of the most interesting victims of circumstance 2018 and the few years preceding it have seen. Tomb Raider is not Uncharted, it's a series that is wildly different but a series that far too few gamers are playing. When you reboot a series in any entertainment medium, you run the risk of soiling something that was once great. Something that thousands, sometimes millions of people hold near and dear to their hearts. So all too often, reboots rely heavily on nostalgia. They play heavily into an audience that has long since moved on. Tomb Raider managed to avoid those trappings while falling into a few new ones. Today's piece is a look at what the hell is happening to Tomb Raider, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and what may befall Shadow of the Tomb Raider. How does a damn good set of games underperform? How can a series of this quality be so underplayed by the community, and why has the rebooted trilogy failed to break into the mainstream in any meaningful way? Welcome to the new Supernatural. Laura Croft was meant to be a man. There's a fact that might blow your mind in 2018, but in the early 90s when Toby Gard created a new adventure game character, that was her reality. But being afraid that the character would be too derivative of Indiana Jones, Gard made the decision to switch the gender and Laura Croft, as we know it today, was born. Eidos was in dire straits in the early 90s, nearing closure and being financially decimated. Tomb Raider's 1996 release is the release that may have saved the company. The curvy heroine was a massive commercial success and led to the formation of an idea, annualization. And this went, well, poorly. The game spent the next seven years releasing a new game each and every year. It decimated the studio. It got so bad that they actually tried to find a way to kill off Laura Croft to stop making the games. An idea that obviously did not come to fruition the way they expected. At one point during the development of Tomb Raider Chronicles, the team would admit to not even being fully invested in the game's development. This all came to a head with Angel of Darkness. In an attempt to compete with the larger, action-focused games of the time, ambitions were higher. Well, at least for the developer core designs. Eidos, on the other hand, not so much. Eidos wanted the game out faster than the studio was able to make it, so Eidos forced them to cut large sections of the game and push it out long before it was finished, and it showed. The game was a mess, fans and critics alike were not happy, and this was the first real nail in the coffin of what Tomb Raider was. A new trilogy of games were released a little bit later on, but would be both unremarkable in quality and sales. They were good enough, but nothing groundbreaking and simply couldn't compete with the rest of the action genre. Reboots are hard, and about halfway through the previous generation, Crystal Dynamics was left with a choice. Abandon traditional Tomb Raider games or reinvent the franchise. They chose the latter, splitting the team into two, one of which will go on to make Guardian of the Light, and the other, on something new. Beginning development, or at least pre-development in 2008, and continuing development for the next five years, Tomb Raider was becoming brand new once again. But the problem was, well, expectations might have been a little bit too high. Before we get into the things that make this game something you should, or in some cases shouldn't be playing, it's important to note the biggest reason so many people already aren't and examine some awful decision making. The marketing for the Tomb Raider reboot was, well, fairly poor. It wasn't as though Square Enix made some egregious error like EA did recently with Battlefield 5. They didn't call their consumers idiots. The marketing was simply unremarkable, and there was far too little of it. This, in part, is what led to the reboot falling short of the company's sales expectations, and also put the franchise back on the ropes. From there, Square Enix grossly overreacted to the circumstances surrounding that 2013 game. The lower than expected sales, which were still great, by the way, made a sequel a risk to Square. So to ensure the financial profitability of a sequel, Square wanted a backer. They struck a deal with Microsoft to make them the exclusive marketing partner for Rise of the Tomb Raider, and in the process committed a fatal flaw, in making the game a timed one-year exclusive to the Xbox One. This was one of the most questionable and poorly thought out decisions the company has made this generation. They took a recognizable gaming icon and pigeonholed it into a system that at the time was severely lagging behind in the sales of its competitor, and a system whose word of mouth was waning. Sure, it has since recovered, but that's today, not when Rise of the Tomb Raider was being launched. And then they did launch it, right? alongside Fallout 4 in the Star Wars Battlefront reboot. And when I say alongside, I mean they literally launched the game on the same day as Fallout 4, November 10th, 
a total and complete death sentence. Plus, the messaging was confusing. Was this an Xbox exclusive forever? Was it timed? They weren't clear until two months later when they clarified. Regardless, Rise of the Tomb Raider failed spectacularly as a result. Most people had no idea the game was launching, and when it did, it showed. And while we never got any concrete sales data long term, and while we know the sales did pick up eventually, for obvious reasons, we know that it failed abysmally in the UK at launch, but we also know that the 12 million plus sales the first game eventually reached was a number that Rise wouldn't even come close to. A game that settled in around 7 million total sales, just over half of what the original sold. This, again, despite sounding like an amazing amount of copies shifted, was at this point unsurprising surprisingly seen as underperforming in the eyes of Square Enix. And while these sales look exceptional, the games deserve and could be so much more. So what exactly is under the hood? Is the problem the games themselves? The comparisons to Uncharted were always going to be unavoidable, even though when Uncharted first released, it was being compared to Tomb Raider. Both games are the premier climb, jump, and find treasure games on consoles today, but in reality, underneath that very trite surface, the two are markedly different games. But the comparisons have without a doubt hurt Tomb Raider, which in some ways is the better game. Uncharted is a character-driven series, one that especially with Uncharted 4 focuses heavily on narrative and relationship development. In that way, strictly from a narrative perspective, Uncharted 4 probably has a leg up. It may indeed do that better, but where Tomb Raider sets itself apart from the pack is when you look past narrative. Which for Tomb Raider is pretty great in its own right, sometimes. Tomb Raider's moment to moment gameplay is in many ways what Uncharted 4 shifted itself to attempt to become. In these Tomb Raider games, you are given much more freedom, even with its linear structure. Levels are much more open than the first three Uncharted games, and they absolutely make use of that openness. Exploration is encouraged through reward. When you explore in Rise of the Tomb Raider, for example, you may be rewarded with an entirely new gameplay opportunity that is totally optional in the form of tombs that act as sprawling environmental puzzles, or you may be rewarded with hunting opportunities that allow you to upgrade your equipment, or better yet, level up, which we'll come back to. You aren't going off the beaten path simply to chase PSN trophies. Those open levels reward you if you explore them, but the biggest difference is the tone each game takes. Take this reality of Tomb Raider, for example. As Forbes originally reported, the first Tomb Raider, at one point in development, had a scene in the game that they called the rape scene. This scene saw Laura being trapped and nearly assaulted, forcing her to commit her first killing, but due to the portrayal of attempted sexual violence, it was cut from the game. Where Uncharted is an awesome Indiana Jones-style cinematic adventure, Tomb Raider is a gritty, harsh, and often mean-spirited story of the struggle of a woman against the oddities of the world. These two series are drastically different in tone and gameplay and narrative, but the comparisons have caused a clear problem for the sales of Tomb Raider, with many believing that it has no chance against something like Uncharted and going with the latter simply for that very reason. Even if they often shouldn't be made in the first place, these comparisons have made their way throughout gaming. But the biggest way that Tomb Raider separates itself is also one of the games greatest assets in this tiny little subgenre. Tomb Raider today is a much deeper and arguably richer gameplay experience than the simplicity that was offered by the series' original seven-year run. Where Tomb Raider was once just defined by light puzzling mixed in with some action platforming, modern Tomb Raider veers much closer to an RPG. While there's certainly a lot of straight-up climbing and jumping and even puzzling, and maybe a bit too much climbing and jumping, all of it is done in an effort to make Laura a more proficient explorer and a more proficient killer. They do this through a leveling system, particularly in Rise, that encourages you to experience as much of the game as humanly possible possible instead of just working your way through to the very end on a straight path. Hunting for example here is key because much like in Far Cry, that hunting will allow you to upgrade your equipment, making Laura's life considerably easier, and while it's not a new mechanic, it's a way to keep the player directly involved in their own progress as opposed to simply handing them upgrades every couple of hours that feel unearned, which has its place here as well. From there, there's a traditional XP system and skill tree, things that do quite a bit to change the way you play as opposed to the sometimes useless skill trees you find in other games that exist just to say that they have them. And while not all of it does matter, things like the triple shot, arrow retrieval, and animal instincts all do well to immerse you further into this world, making Laura even more of a survivalist and also giving you a sense of true progress as you make your way up that skill tree. By turning this rebooted series into an RPG light, a series that was once great but often too shallow now has a bit of depth and more importantly replayability, even if the games don't really do anything new with these mechanics. But with new comes the end of a trilogy, and Shadow of the Tomb Raider is here, and it's changing things up while also giving us a bit more of the same.
must be here for the... Hey, feel free to look around and... So here we are with Shadow of the Tomb Raider, a game with a very different development cycle than the previous two games thanks to Eidos Montreal going from a support studio to the core development studio, which, let's be real, can be a little bit concerning. Switching developers mid-franchise is almost never a good thing. It's a game that costs over $100 million to make, the most expensive Tomb Raider to date, which puts Square Enix in an all-too-familiar position with a public recognition that the game has to make a substantial amount of money to be worth their time. They are again setting Tomb Raider up to fail, even if Shadow of the Tomb Raider looks pretty great, it may not matter to them. In response, the team at Montreal put more of an emphasis on a multiplayer function in order to push the game's longevity through leaning into the games as a service trend. Now that isn't to say that this is going to be the dominating attribute of Shadow, but it is worth noting that development resources obviously had to be placed there, and God only knows what this means for post-launch monetization. But the single player experience is still safe and sound regardless, which is the real reason that anybody at all would purchase this game. But things have changed, Eidos acknowledged the cognitive dissonance that was created by making adventurer and explorer Lara a brutal mass murderer, so instead of leaning into the stealth a bit more like they try to do with Rise, they made Lara deadlier, and sure there's more stealth, but there's more tools in her arsenal for killing than ever, and they've even made sure that the plot apparently acknowledges that dissonance issue. Well, kind of. Early reports and gameplay show Lara as a ruthless and remorseless killer in ways that she was not in the previous two games. But this is also the end of a trilogy, and the end of an origin story, and Eidos wanted to maintain the tone of that trilogy, and thus Shadow of the Tomb Raider is still excessively dark and takes itself very seriously, which is in tonal juxtaposition to the original games. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. We all know the difference between Tim Burton's Batman and Christopher Nolan's. Dark doesn't necessarily equate to poor quality. But tombs are also back in full force, waiting to be raided, and that's a little bit less serious. And they're bigger than ever, requiring full use of all your tools. Puzzle solving here will be an integral part of that experience, and in ways that are a little more intricate than they were in previous games. But in reality, it will just be interesting to see how players respond to Lara's third adventure in this new universe, given just how little noise the game is already making as its poor marketing continues to barely make a splash. If you had told me in that PS1 or PS2 era that a brand new AAA Tomb Raider game wouldn't get the world as excited as any other IP, I would have called you crazy. And yet here we are, a part of that very reality. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is 2018's most under-discussed game. It's flown under the radar in a way that is borderline shocking given the brand recognition of its IP. But maybe that's okay. Clearly the sales are high enough to justify repeated sequels, so maybe it's okay that not every game becomes some monolithic smash hit that breaks the mainstream all over the world. Maybe it's okay for there to be a return of the middle class of video games in terms of sales. Tomb Raider is great, it has its flaws and its issues are no secret, but it's an experience that is worth $60. It doesn't need to be some expansive multiplayer platform, it doesn't need to drown in post-launch monetization opportunities, it can just be what it is and what it always has been a quality single player game that wants you to turn on your console and immerse yourself in what's in front of you without worrying about anybody or anything else. And that's something worth advocating for, and a kind of experience that's worth preserving. Shadow of the Tomb Raider could repeat the very same mistakes as its predecessors, Square could repeat the very same mistakes, Eidos could repeat the very same mistakes, but regardless, I'm glad that the game exists. Tomb Raider is a staple of this medium, and it's nice to know it's always there, even if some people have already forgotten it. Well guys, that is it for today's doc, and it's always sort of a dialogue. What do you think of these rebooted Tomb Raider games? Do you think that they're better or worse than what we were getting on the PS3? Do you think they're better than worse than what that seven year run looked like or what it was? Did you even play that run? As obviously now those games are over 20 years old, or some of them are. But more importantly, what do you think is Tomb Raider's biggest problem in terms of really breaking through the mainstream, in terms of really doing the kind of numbers and getting the kind of recognition that Uncharted gets? Do you think it's the things discussed here, or do you think it's something else? Let me know the answers to any of those questions down in the comments below. Let's have a real conversation. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button. If you're not yet a member of this team, press subscribe. We put out gaming and film analysis, examinations, and essays just like this one twice, sometimes three times a week. So subscribe so you do not miss any. Um, I want to make a really quick announcement, uh, and I might make a longer video to make this announcement, um, but uh, I, many of you know about the event that happened in Jacksonville uh, recently at the Madden Tournament, and um, it uh, made me realize that I think that uh, maybe not the community, but me in general, I'm not doing enough. And so um, from here on out, and I'll get more specific soon, I want to make sure I'm donating a percentage of the ad revenue for each video to charity. Uh, I haven't landed on which one. It may be the same one. 
um, that the ad revenue from the last video was going to. Um, but I'll figure that out in the near future and I'll let you guys know. Um, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, I'm sorry. I put up more and more each and every week. Maybe catch one of those. Maybe you'll enjoy that. But if not, thank you for giving me and the channel a shot. And until next time, guys, I'm out.